Welcome to University Place Presents. I'm Norman Gilliland. The 4th of July, Thanksgiving, those are great times to celebrate American music, but actually any day will do. And we're going to celebrate American music with a sampling of 200 years of American song featuring Trevor Stevenson and his talented quartet of singers. To an Acreon in hand, where he sat in full glee, a few sons of harmony sent a petition that he their inspirer and patron would be. When this answer arrived from the jolly old Grecian, voice fiddle and flute, no longer be mute. I'll lend you my name and inspire you to boot. And besides, I'll instruct you like me to entwine the myrtle of Venus with Bacchus's vine. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail like the twilight's last gleaming? Whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight for the round which we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say. Is it my imagination, Trevor, or was it a lot easier to sing as a drinking song? <laughs> <laughs> well, it didn't it's, it's probably harder without a ballpark around, you know? Yeah, that's true. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, but it's, ama it's amazing that it's the same song, right? Yeah, yeah. With a few accidentals changed here and there. Right, uh, not the official national anthem until 1931, so a right. lot of time to make those changes over the years. Right, so it, it begins in its first form as an English gentleman's club song with, uh, you know, written, written by William Stafford Smith, uh, and those are the original words. There are, of course, something like 10 or 12 verses to it, which I'm sure they just went on and on, you know, uh, uh, winding up as they as they went. Did you and, say and winding up or winding up? Winding <laughs> up, and lots of, yeah. I mean, it's all about Bacchus. It's, it's yeah. Yeah, and, and, and Akron, right, the, the god of having a good time, or uh, at least a, an early poet of having a good time. Um, then, Fran So that tune is in the air and is quite well known when Francis Scott Key in 1812, while he's watching the Battle uh, of Fort McHenry, uh, he writes his own poem, which we now as the Star Spangled Banner, to that existing tune, Anacreon in Heaven. And so that that's how it all gets fused together. It's called a parody technique, uh, writing new words to old tunes. Uh, and so everybody would have been able to jump on board, but as you said, not until the 1930s does it become a national anthem. Yeah. Well, before we go further, introduce our talented singers. Yes, this has been it's just a joyous week here. Uh, I'll start, start here on this end with a bass Michael Hawes. He's from Chicago. We're just thrilled he came up to Madison for this this fun fun few days. It's, thank you, Michael. And next to him is Nola Richardson, soprano from New York City. Uh, we've worked together a lot and just think, thanks for jumping on an airplane and coming mm -hmm. out. Uh, and next to her is Alto, mezzo alto, <laughs> Clara Osowski uh, uh, from Minneapolis. And uh, I Actually, just back from England, so uh, that was a, a lot of flying for you as well. And Scott Brunshine, who uh, lives now in Des Moines, he's singing tenor. Uh, he's lived all over the place and is now at teaching at Drake in Des Moines. Well, let's stay in the 18th century for a while. There was American music, other than, of course, uh, to Anacreon in Heaven and the Star Spangled Banner, right. uh, being composed in the 18th century and uh, some real uh, colorful 
characters emerge, don't they? William, we'll start with William Billings uh, and two pieces by him, one called The Bird, which is a, a, a very religious text, a beautiful poem. Uh, why I'm like a bird always flying from God, even though God is, is trying to, to take care of me. Uh, and then the second one is uh, called Africa. The, two, the, uh, the name has nothing to do with the text. It's a, just a simply very... Um, evangelical Isaac Watts text, uh, um, so Africa doesn't play in it, but that was something they liked to do, kind of have uh, uh, puzzling titles to pieces. It was a, a game. William Billings was quite a character. He's, he's born in uh, 1746. He's a Bostonian. Uh, he's not particularly educated. He's self-taught as a musician. He's a tanner by trade. He was one of the most asymmetrical looking people ever with uh, a short one short leg and one eye, and with snuff paraphernalia dangling all over him. He was completely addicted to snuff. Uh, apparently not particularly elegant of speech either, uh, except when he talked music, you, the people say, you knew you were talking to a real musician. And some of uh, that sounds yeah. a little, even to our ears today, a little avant-garde, some of those pieces by Billings. He wrote pieces that, that have uh, quite pungent dissonances deliberately interjected into them, uh, a little bit as a precursor to the great Charles Ives, who we'll get to later. So maybe it's just in the American water. <laughs> and then, we, and then yeah. we also have Quakers. Right, and then after the Billings pieces, we'll have uh, two Quaker tunes, uh, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, uh, and then uh, My Life Flows On, An Endless Song, and that's followed by a Shaker tune, uh, Give Good Gifts. Uh, all, those all are all part of the great 19th century American religious revivals. Uh, there were, there were, the 19th century was really a, a, a strong time for that, and the music is spectacular, so we'll sample them. Since I have placed my trust in God, a refuge always nigh, why should I like a tearless bird to distant mountains fly? Why should I lie? Found of every vision, lift our eyes. 
Lovely stuff. You know, there's one star up here that we haven't talked about yet. <laughs> yes. Who is this here? Uh, and is it even American? And the, the answer is no. It's a European import. This is a, an 1855, circa 1855, Viennese Bersendorfer piano uh, that made its way uh, here actually probably in the 1970s or 80s. Its magic is that it's all wooden in construction. It has no metal plate in it. So it is a kind of a, a massive guitar in a way. <laughs> There's just two little struts in there. It also has the old German action in it, which is a, a still an 18th century style forte piano action with a very, very responsive. It's a very quick action, but you can hear quite a mellow sound and many different registers. The, the, the top and the bottom and everything in between have, sound more like soprano, tenor, alto and bass, it, it, it's, uh, those zones are there. It, uh, there's a long story about how it got here. And, uh, we don't have time for it, but it ended up in Milwaukee in the 1980s, and uh, along with about 40 other of these instruments. I spent about two years rebuilding this and, and uh, restringing it and, and with period wire and, and hammer parts and things like that. Uh, so we're, we're so glad, you know, and you can see it's made from the age of just love of wood. Uh, they, it was just uh, the wood grain is, is magnificent. I'm trying to think of anything. Oh, I guess the man who made it, uh, Ignaz Bersendorfer, ran the factory. He was at the end of his life when this was made in the 1850s. When he started in the uh, around 1810, 1815, making pianos in Vienna, he would have. I mean, Beethoven and Schubert would have been their clients. You know, this is kind of a rear guard action, 1850s instrument, but really looking back and really to the late 18th century aesthetic. 
it's just really fun to play and we've been moving it around a lot. <laughs> and contemporary with our next composer by uh, one of those remarkable coincidences of history, July 4th, 1826. Right. John Adams dies, Thomas Jefferson dies. Yeah. It's the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence and Stephen Foster, <laughs> Foster is born. Is born on the All same day. All the right? same day. So what, July 4th? 1826. 1826, right. So a good day, yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, and Foster is born uh, just in near Pittsburgh, uh, which a lot of people don't know. He always seems like a Mason Dixon composer, sure. you know. Uh, but he is a northerner and uh, he, he makes a living as a songwriter for, for you know, quite some time. One of his, his first big hits is Oh Susanna, which we'll be doing in this next set. About 1847. Um, mm -hmm. Right. When the, he's, he's publishing, he's doing all right. He's a very careful, wor he works quite carefully. He's not a performer. Mm -hmm. He really he likes to write songs. And of course, his tunes are, are largely lifted from people he would have heard. I mean, that would, borrowing was perfectly fine. But I think his magic is he always, he wrote his own words and he was able to make the words really add up to the tune, to what they were saying. And that fusion, is what we respond to. Um, besides the tunes themselves being great, there's something about the way the words are working as well. And they would have been particularly uh, poignant, a lot of them, for people of his time. Hard times come again no more. Certainly right. people were familiar with hard times in this country right. in the 1850s and 60s. And right. you mentioned O oh, Susanna, which is one of his most uh, buoyant right. tunes. Um, he actually at one point said that Hard Times was his favorite of his own songs, or uh, the one that he enjoyed. Possibly he could uh, enjoyed. relate to it most, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, uh, just one other thing that the last song we'll be doing of the Stephen Foster set uh, is called uh, the, the Voices That Are Gone. And he wrote it during the Civil War. Things are, are of course, the country is in extreme crisis and, and the music business is also in crisis. Publishing is, is really going away. He's writing some war songs, which are not, not his strong suit. Uh, but he writes this beautiful ghostly poem, The Voices That Are Gone, uh, and sets it in the key of C major which in the old tuning systems that we have on here today, C major was the, the most kind of unreal sounding of all keys, the purest in many ways. So we'll and end I with think, that. Uh, I think Jeannie will put in an appearance too. Yes, I dream of Jeannie with uh, light brown hair. She will be here as well. Let us pause in life's pleasures and count its many tears while we all sup sorrow with the poor. There's a song that will linger forever in our ears. Oh, hard times come again no more. Tis the song, the sigh of the
I'm from Alabama with my banjo on my knee. And I'm going to Louisiana, my true love for to see. It rained all night the day I left, the weather, it was dry. The sun so hot, I froze to death. Susanna, don't you cry. Oh, Susanna, don't you cry for me. Cause I come from Alabama with my banjo on my knee. Susanna, dear, a coming down the hill. A red, red rose was in her hand, and a tear was in her eye. I said, I come from Dixieland. Susanna, don't you cry. Oh, Susanna, don't you cry for me. As I come from Alabama, with my banjo on my knee. Sure. 
Thank you. Thank you. One of the romantic tragedies of American music, Stephen Foster dies at 37 with 38 cents in his pocket and a slip <laughs> of paper that says, Dear Friends and Gentle Hearts. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. In, in New York City, yeah, in, in hard times for him, too. Publishing business had really gone down and, and, and money was quite scarce. There were some songwriters at that time, though, the Civil War, that were doing pretty well. Uh, one exactly. of them was George F. Root, right? Uh, best known for yeah. Tending on the Old Campground. And uh, the Battle Cry of Freedom. Battle cry yeah, of freedom. but Tending on the new Old yeah. Campground. And, or New Campground, sometimes. It's like, it's, <laughs> yeah. It gets mixed up. It was somebody yeah. else's right. campground yeah. last night, but now it's ours. But yeah. It's... Exactly. Root, uh, George Root <laughs> published uh, war songs during the war. They're quite successful, and, uh, and we're going to, to do one of them here. Uh, and then the, the Battle Cry of Freedom will appear as a little snippet in the last Ives song that we'll do. So. Charles Ives. We, well, I know we could go on and we could do a series of shows about Charles we Ives, should. and I know you're a big yeah. fan of him. He was, uh, he was an innovator, and you say, oh, you're talking about music? Well, not right away. I'm talking about insurance. Right. Charles Ives had a big day job. He was an insurance executive, yeah. created yeah. the concept of estate planning, which Always is good. popular with many of our broadcast institutions today, <laughs> yes, right. and uh, right. I think also created the concept of training insurance mm -hmm. executives, but right. by and night, he was one heck of a composer. Right, he, uh, so he had uh, a true American example, businessman, great composer, and an innovative composer taught by his father to be so. Uh, uh, Charles Ives' father, George Edward Ives, was a virtuoso cornet player who uh, ended up in the Union Army at the age of like 17 and was in battle situations uh, in the East, uh, uh, who came back from the war. He survived it, uh, set up shop and, and married and had a family in Danbury, Connecticut, uh, and Charles Ives, the composer, is born about in 1874 or so. Uh, George Edward taught Charles Ives to play in one key while singing in another. The same song, right, right. Uh, uh, and also they tuned their two pianos for experiment, they would tune the pianos a quarter step apart. And, and, and so, and bitonality, polytonality was a big part of their language. It's hard to imagine this going on in the 1880s and all, yeah, in this little town in Connecticut, that perhaps the most experimental think tank of all. Um, and Charles Ives, one of his great memories is of childhood watching two bands come into town from the opposite ends of town playing different songs in different keys, and he's sitting on a hill w trying to assemble it. And you can hear it in all of this music. It's incredible how he makes sense out of it. Right? Um, yeah, I had, uh, unbeknownst to me, one time two turntables going at the same time, and I thought I was playing Ives, but uh, it was right. actually <laughs> right. two different things going at the same time. I think one, yeah. at one point he said, what's wrong, are my ears on backwards? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, but, yeah, he had trouble yeah. getting acceptance yeah. in the musical establishment. His father, mm -hmm. though, uh, mm -hmm. I understand, was quite a cornet player. Well, yeah, very, yeah, absolutely, and, and, and again, in, in the Union Army, and then gone on through his life, and his father had played recitals of all Schubert songs, just cornet and piano, uh, parent, with no words, and it, with dizzying beauty <laughs> as well. And the Ives pieces that we'll do here, the first one is a very avant-garde about a leopard in a cage pacing back and forth, uh, and, the, and there's also uh, two little girls playing in the backyard in the second song. There is a shall we gather at the river with, with chords that perhaps even Oscar Peterson wouldn't have thought of. Uh, uh, amazingly innovative jazz chords uh, to that to the old hymn tune at, at the river, and then we'll end with a World War I song, He Is There, uh, which has, of course, in Ives' inimitable fashion, all sorts of world uh, Civil War tunes piled in on top of it, uh, and it's a big parade. Kind of so thing. And I will be joined at the bench for that one. Oh, by spoiler alert. Okay. <laughs> yes. George Root once, and then four from Charles, Charles Ives. Ives. Right.
that's brave around me lying, filled with thoughts of home and God, for well they know that on the morrow some will sleep beneath the sun. went around his cage from one side back to the other side he stopped only when the keeper came around with meat a boy who had been there three hours began to Life anything like that.
Multi-talented crew we have I, here. <laughs> bass singer and piccolo player, right? Yeah, yeah so that's covered at Alpha and Omega there. Yes, right. The, and, and I hope everyone could hear there's just all sorts of songs, you know, and with the national anthem quoted <laughs> right at the end, you know, you know, but in an off measure. I mean, it's just it's really madness. Yeah, and yeah. Charles Ives did right. some. What shall we say? Remarkable recordings of that song and some of his uh, him is so sing, playing <laughs> yes. the piano and him singing uh, it, in a different key or something. Oh yeah, who knows? Right, <laughs> yeah. right. Toward the end of his life, he made that recording. Yeah. Uh, there's a composer, actually, pretty much a contemporary of Charles Ives, mm -hmm. whose very uh, name I'll call it a name change over the course of time <laughs> yeah. says a lot about her. Uh, career and you might say rising fortunes and things that she had to work against uh, early on. Originally known, even I think in the 1970s when her recordings first really became uh, known, or recordings of her music, right. known as Mrs. H.H.A. Beach. Right. But then uh, gradually uh, getting a fuller recognition as Amy, Amy Beach. Beach right. And um, sometimes considered the first major American woman composer. I, I, absolutely. She, she, she published during her lifetime. Um, she was a, a great pianist. She's really a child prodigy pianist and, and did a lot of playing with orchestras and in chamber music and toured Europe and things like that. Uh, but, but she published. She wrote quite a bit of chamber music, symphonic works, and a lot of songs, which we'll hear a um, couple of them here. Uh, she lived mostly in Boston and uh, uh, was born, I guess, what you said? I think 1867. I think she and our next artist, right, uh, Scott <laughs> Joplin, are born around the same year. Yes, that's right. Um, and absolutely uh, stuck to her guns. Uh, and, you know, she's, she is an American composer. She's not using American folk tunes or anything as, so much. Uh, so uh, she listened to a lot of Brahms and Schumann, you could tell. Uh, uh, but she somehow weaves it into an American spell. Um, and uh, we're so glad she took the trouble <laughs> in a time when, when and when you read reviews of her music uh, during her lifetime, it was just, you know, the thing that we wish they hadn't have said. Like, it's, you know, great music, but it's yeah. written by a woman. And it's just, it was just aw it's awful to stomach. And it's kind of a mixed uh, blessing for us, uh, in yeah. a sense, uh, in that uh, her arrangement with her husband, and I guess it wasn't all that unusual at the time, right. was that uh, she was not to take lessons. She was not to teach piano. Right. And exactly. she could play only twice a year, and that had to be for charity because all those things were considered lower class. And right. he was a very Pro wealthy he was a man. prominent doctor. Yeah. yeah the right, so. silver lining being that maybe that gave her more time for composing, <laughs> and she did compose major things, symphonies never, and masses as well right. as, as songs. Yeah, so a, a very, very uh, an amazing figure. And we're going to do these two pieces that we'll do. One is a is a very short um, soprano and piano song based on a Robert Browning poem, which many people know. Uh, the lark. The years in the spring, the the larks on the wing, and you know, God's in His heaven, all's right with the world. Uh, mm -hmm. A wonderful setting in the key of D flat, and then um, uh, Peace be with you, a very spiritual a cappella quartet setting. After that, Amy Beach. Days at the morn, the larks on the wing. 
Well, there's uh, one composer whose uh, years really pretty much define a whole little era of music, mm -hmm. if we say 1898 to 1917. All right, Scott, Scott Joplin, right, born in Texas, and um, his father was a freed slave, his mother was, uh, you know, cleaning houses, but this is right after the Civil War. Um, and Scott Joplin uh, was free, to, you know, somewhat free to travel in those days, uh, even through the South. Uh, and musicians were gathering in all sorts of interesting places, particularly tied to railroad towns. And he ends up uh, at the Chicago World's Fair, 1893, and then in Sedalia, Missouri, where the two of the big railroad lines cross. Uh, musicians were, uh, uh, you know, could work in all sorts of taverns and other things like that, churches and taverns. Uh, <laughs> right. and, um, and and he did, uh, but also. Also, a new style was emerging. It was, uh, they eventually called it ragtime. They were mixing a kind of left hand of marches and quadrilles with the syncopated melodic material from the Caribbean and African influences uh, and fusing these into this in incredibly infectious style uh, with rhythmic drive and then also, uh, a, you know, kind of a floating uh, feathering melody that moves quite quickly in most cases. Um, Joplin writes the Maple Leaf Rag around 1890. 1897, 1898, in Sedalia, Missouri. Uh, John Stark, a publisher, uh, picks it up. Uh, Joplin is smart enough to not give away the rights to it. Greatest rag ever written, and it actually gets been, uh, royalties throughout his life. Yes, and we're not uh, more than, uh, speaking of uh, dancing, uh, skipping a jump away from that most American of institutions, Broadway. By the yes. time we get to Joplin, 1917, mm -hmm. the end really of the ragtime era, right. really just a few years until you have this real blossoming <laughs> of musical theater in America. The Gershwin brothers are coming and, and yeah. all sorts of great Broadway is, is hit, hits in the 20s. Yeah. And, and, um, and we will, uh, the next song is by Richard Rogers with his uh, first uh, lyricist partner, Lawrence Hart, uh, from a show around, comes in around in 1930 called Babes in Arms. And uh, it's a famous song. Everybody knows it is My Funny Valentine. Uh, just beautiful fusion of, of lyrics and tune. It's set in the key of great gravitas, as C minor, mm. you know. Uh, so <laughs> how's that for a Valentine's present? Yeah, you know, right. So. Happy Valentine's Day. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, uh, uh, we'll do that, and then followed by Cole Porter, Anything Goes, which also is in C minor, moving to C major. And the Porter, of course, his, his genius in this song is talking about how times have changed, and what used to be risque is now just every day. Uh, and, and of course, that, that clock continues to move on, right? Uh, and, and he sang versions of it uh, that were risque, just for fun. Oh, yeah. I mean, he, he had constant fun with this song. There's a recording of Porter singing about eight verses of this with all, <laughs> stepping on all sorts of contemporaries in his, <laughs> of his time. <laughs> so anyway, we'll do uh, Funny Valentine and then Anything Goes.
Guy. <laughs> yeah, what a witty guy. There's a lot more where that came from, both in uh, the works of Cole Porter and in American music. Of course, yes. this was just a very small patchwork <laughs> quilt right. representing the big picture. Right. Any way to characterize it? Oh, my. I, a, a, a country with many uh, uh, streams flowing, sometimes in opposite directions, but <laughs> somehow making a beautiful whole. <laughs> Right. And breaking so, news, there are living American composers. Yes, and we'll end with a, a hymn by Kim Oler, uh, who lives in upstate New York. Uh, and this has found its way into the Unitarian hymnal, and uh, it just always brings the house down. It's called the For the Earth Forever Turning. Uh, and the, the inspiration for the text I, uh, was uh, kind of seeing the earth from space, uh, seeing as that beautiful blue marble spinning <laughs> in space, and, and, and in a way, re, you know, getting closer to it because you can see the whole, I think, uh, and the, the love that is with that. So we'll end with three verses of For the Earth Forever Turning. Yeah. 
hope you've enjoyed this 200 year exploration of American song and many thanks to Trevor Stevenson and our gifted singers and to our studio audience and to you for watching and listening. I'm Norman Gilliland. I hope you can join me next time around for University Place Presents. Thank you.